Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar about using BODS data to create real-time information. Um, please um, do feel free to uh, use the chat function to uh, ask questions uh, as we go. We'll pick those up at the end in the Q&A session. Um, we are recording this. Uh, and um, you'll get a uh, link to it um, once it's uh, published, uh, which should be uh, later this week. Um, so you can uh, recap on it or share it with uh, anybody that couldn't be with us live. Um, so um, this afternoon, we're going to um, explore why predictions are important, um, looking at some of the research. Um, we're then going to cover how you actually create predictions um, and then how you can access bus open data and some of the new ways that have been added recently. Um, and then we're going to talk about using BODS data and uh, we've got R2P who are going to show us um, some of their um, products that actually use BODS data, um, not just a, a, an example of, um, of, a, of an app or anything like that, some, some real world analytical um, use. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, a Q&A session. So um, why are predictions about when a bus is going to arrive at a bus stop so important? Um, Transport Focus, who carry out research and represent public transport and road users, regularly survey passengers to understand their priorities for what needs to change. Um, and uh, in September 2020, they did a report on bus passenger priority for improvement. Um, and of the 10 priorities that they highlighted, um, real-time information predictions can have an impact on five. So more people, more buses on time at the bus stop, um, more bus journeys on time, faster journey times, uh, more bus stops with next bus displays, uh, and better quality of information at bus stops. Um, and then there are another few um, uh, lower down in the, uh, in the top 30. Um, but as you can see, um, there's a good number of places where passengers' expectations and requirements uh, mean that they want to see more predictions. Um, because um, it helps passengers to better plan their trips if they know exactly when a bus is going to arrive, uh, if the um, journeys are more reliable, um, and um, in a uh, digital bus innovations report that was commissioned by Transport for London a couple of years ago, um, they customers prioritised two broad information needs at buses uh, and bus stops. Um, they want to know when their next bus is coming and how long their journeys will take. Both things that are very clearly to do with real-time information and predictions. So with that in mind, how do we actually create a prediction? How do we create a countdown time that somebody might see on an app or a bus stop? Um, this is a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of um, creating predictions. Some of the other sessions that we've done over the last couple of years go into this in a bit more detail. So you might want to, uh, to have a look at those if you want to, uh, to dig down uh, under the surface of this. So um, at a simple level, at a timetable um, and a countdown time, if we take our simplest theoretical case, um, we'll add a little bit of complexity um, as we go through this. But if we've got a single bus running on a single route um, that's running a single trip um, and it visits three bus stops, 
Um, and it takes 10 minutes to get between each bus stop, as I say. A uh, very simple theoretical case. In reality, we know it's going to be much more complex than that. But um, if we assume that there's perfect conditions on the trip, and the timetable is perfect, it really does take 10 minutes to get from one bus stop to the next, and there's no congestion, there's no passengers that are needing to to board um, that are taking longer than, uh, than, than you would expect. None of the real world operational challenges faced by an operator. Um, then actually the timetable um, is all that's needed. And so you can um, just present the timetable um, as a countdown time uh, you know, with 10 minutes between each bus stop um, because we know the bus is going to arrive perfectly at time at each stop. However, we know that in reality uh, that is not going to happen. Um, and so how do we get a bit more clever than just uh, presenting the timetable in a countdown fashion? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to know where the bus is. Um, and these days, knowing where this bus currently is, uh, it's done pretty much always by uh, GPS, by the same technology that you've got in your sat-nav and your phone that you use to navigate around, that knows where you are. Buses um, through ticket machine or other equipment um, know where they are and can uh, provide that information through to a real-time system. Typically, a bus is going to report its position every 10 to 30 seconds, something like that. Um, which allows the position that the bus is along its route to be tracked. Um, a little bit of simple maths um, allows us to um, actually predict how long it's going to take from its current position to um, the, uh, the next bus stop. Um, however, again, whilst What's on the screen at the moment is a nice straight line. <coughs> Roads are not straight lines. You know, they go round curves and things like that. And so um, our original simple maths needs to be uh, slightly more complicated, um, unless you're going along on a Roman road, that is, which is, um, you know, straight line. Um, you're going to be going um, off round corners and things like that. So a little bit of trigonometry uh, needs to factor in to, uh, to actually work out um, distances and things like that. Um, and this is why track data is important. Um, we might know where the bus stops are, but we need really to know where um, the bus is going to go along the road. So we need to know where the roads are. Um, and uh, a real world example. Um, track is the route that the bus takes between two bus stops. Um, typically, this will be something like uh, Ordnance Survey Master Map or Open Street Map, that sort of thing. Um, and the road is broken down into sections. Um, and um, in your timetable data, you can say which sections of the road uh, the bus travels along, um, and that helps it. Um, helps you piece it together so you know um, the distances that the bus is actually going to travel. So in this case, the bus going from bus stop A to bus stop B, it's pretty straight. Um, actually, that's a nice, simple um, process. You know, if you drew a straight line between the two, that actually would be pretty close to how far the bus is going to go um, along the road. However, um, when the bus leaves bus stop B and heads off towards bus stop C. If you just used a straight line, as you can see, um, you're going to be quite a long way short of actually the, the distance the bus travels, and that will have an effect on how accurate a prediction is. And so ideally, uh, we need to know the tracks that the bus is taking um, to, uh, to improve the accuracy. So um, now we know um, how far the bus has got to travel and where it is along the road. 
um, we can start to um, add in um, some interesting real world challenges, um, some intelligence, um, because in the original um, example where we were just providing timetable data as a countdown, um, that's never going to happen in reality. So um, you know, we might have congestion as the bus gets towards the end of its journey as it heads into uh, into a centre. Um, and um, we might know from previous journeys on previous days that the bus has gone um, along this road that actually that's typically a three minute delay. And so rather than the time at the, uh, at the final bus stop being 22 minutes, actually we really should be presenting that as 25 minutes. Now, congestion changes um, quite rapidly sometimes. And so um, if that congestion cleared, if the vans that were blocking the road um, drove away, actually suddenly 25 minutes to arrive at the stop would be wrong. And so we constantly need to be readjusting our calculations and our assumptions and learning as much as we can from uh, things like other buses going along the same stretch of road, um, what's happened in the past, um, and increasingly other sources of intelligence. Uh, we all have got mobile phones probably, um, which as we're driving along uh, with phone in our pocket, um, that's actually telling um, mobile networks where we are. Um, our sat navs are often um, talking back to base um, to tell um, them where we are and urban traffic control centers that an authority has, has got detectors and sensors on the road network and has got um, idea of, uh, of what congestion levels are and road speeds are and things like that. And so all of those sources can be used to um, feed into predictions to help improve the accuracy uh, and respond more quickly when things change. So to be able to um, get to a, uh, a reasonable quality of predictions, um, we need some data from um, bus companies and operators. Um, so we need to know the line so we, um, to be able to, to say um, what the number is and the destination and things like that. We need the timetable um, and we need to know where the bus is, um, its GPS location, um, and ideally we need to know some tracks. All of those are things that operators um, need to provide to BODS. Tracks is optional, but um, as we've uh, as we've seen, um, quite important. Um, line timetables and GPS data are mandated um, under the uh, the Bus Service Act. Um, we can get more um, nuanced um, by adding history into. Um, calculations, so you know, recent past journeys, either for the same service or other service, what happened on a previous week or month, um, what happened last Tuesday, um, because that might actually be different to what happened last Monday if it was a today's a market day, for example, and what happened um, when it was wet is often quite different to when it's dry, um, and so being able to um, store what's happened in the past and understand the context of it uh, means that you can get uh, improved predictions um, and accuracy for the customer. Um, so um, we've had a very simple um, example um, so far. Um, life is inevitably more complicated than that and so we actually need to do um, some matching of data um, to identify um, actual um, buses and journeys and things like that because life is never as simple as a single bus on a single trip. Um, we have multiple 
buses running around with multiple routes. Um, and so how do we go about identifying what individual journey a bus is running to be able to know what it should be doing from the timetable? So we, we start a bit of a guessing game. Um, if all we know is that it's 10 o'clock in the morning and it's a service 23, now that's fine. If you've just got the one journey going in the one direction, um, quite often timetables for ease of customer understanding um, are clock faced. So you will quite often have um, the same service starting from either end at the same time um, because um, it's easier for customers. They like to, to have things happening on a regular basis. Um, it's easier to remember. So actually, how do you know um, which bus is running which journey? You might be able to um, guess from where the bus is. So it, it's location. You might be able to um, identify that and match based on location of the bus and the first stop something like that um, but the more journeys that you've got the more buses that are running the more complex it gets um, and the cleverer you need to get in your journey matching and so um, to make that as easy as possible on top of the basic data um, it's really useful to understand the operator um, because real-time systems most of the time um, aren't just operator specific. Um, BODS data, for example, certainly isn't. So you need to know operator. Um, you need to know the direction. You know, is it inbound, outbound, anti-clockwise, clockwise if it's a circular service, that sort of thing, because that helps um, differentiate which journey is being run which helps you then um, match up the information and provide a prediction at the right stop showing the right time um, the the real gold plated bit of data um, is um, the unique vehicle journey reference um, or journey code depending on the data set that you're looking at that's some unique identifier that uniquely identifies the journey that a vehicle is running. Once you've got that, you can really rapidly um, and simply identify which journey in a timetable that you should be matching. If you can't match that because um, the driver, for example, has entered something wrong into their ticket machine or the, li the, the live data that the vehicle understands is different to the timetable, you then need to fall back and start to use some of the other techniques of uh, matching operator and line number and working out what direction it is and where it is geographically and things like that. But if you've got um, a unique vehicle journey, um, sometimes called journey code, um, that's really easy and quick. Um, and that's why um, in the um, Siri for bus open data, that's required. So um, that's how to match for uh, the journey that the vehicle is currently operating on. Um, it's good to be able to provide information to a customer um, cross journey, um, particularly where you've got um, displays or you've got a customer waiting at the first few stops of a journey. Um, typically, a bus doesn't just run one journey a day. Uh, it will normally operate lots of journeys, um, which means that, um, in theory, we can um, link those journeys together to help provide better customer information. Um, and um, on the top, 
um, line. We've got a bus route that's arriving in the town centre at the bus station at 10.30. Um, and that bus then departs that same place uh, on another journey at 10.40. Um, so it's got 10 minutes between arriving and departing to allow a bit of time for, for catch up might have a driver change to allow passengers to get off and, and board, um, all of the stuff that goes on between journeys. Um, so we need to be able to link those two together, particularly when, you know, if you've got a lot of um, problems on a route because of congestion, for example, and the bus is getting in late, um, that affects how soon the bus can depart on its next journey. Um, if, if the delay to the in, inbound journey is 12 minutes, say, that actually takes the bus, means the bus is arriving at its destination after it should have already left. Um, and if we don't know that the bus that's going to be running the 1040 journey is running late, um, we might start to... Um, display countdowns on a uh, display that are wrong. We might just keep it stuck at um, clock, for, you know, timetable time. Um, but typically when a bus has um, reached um, its, uh, its, its timetable time, um, a display might move that because it assumes that it's been and gone, but in reality it hasn't. So what we need to do is link those two journeys so that we can provide accurate information to customers waiting for that second journey before the bus has started running that journey. So by linking them together, we know that the bus is going to can't leave um, its origin um, for at least two minutes. Um, and so we can um, um, depart uh, and provide um, better quality information. So to be able to do that, um, we need something more than the timetable that you could that you would give to um, a passenger. We need some operational data. Um, now, ideally, that's um, in Siri and Trans Exchange, something called block number, block ref. Um, more normally, if you're talking to, a, to an operator, they'll understand it as a running board or a bus working number, something like that, um, because that ties up all the different journeys that the vehicle is going to be doing during the day. Um, and um, if you've got dead runs, if you've got um, journeys between, if you've got bus that goes without any passengers, for example, from a depot to the to the bus station to, to run the first journey of the day, having that data allowing us to, to track uh, and in effect predict when it's running light, running empty, um, that helps us um, provide better customer information because if it doesn't leave the garage in the morning um, until um, uh, after it should have done then the first journey of the day um, will be running late at the start and we can provide that information if we've got dead run information um, but we know that not everybody uh, has got that so that's how we create a prediction that's um, how we, um, the bits of data that, that are needed to create um, each of those. We've had a question in from um, Jeff about rural services where the GPS is poor. Um, most of the time in rural areas, it's not the GPS that's the problem. So it's not the, the bus knowing where it is. Um, it's the, the ability to provide that location back to the back office because the mobile phone signal isn't good enough or, or it's absent um, along stretches of road. Um, that is a uh, significant challenge. Typically, um, if data updates are missing for 
um, a short period, maybe five minutes, something like that, then a back off real time system will carry on predicting um, based on um, what it last knew, hoping that the bus is going to start communicating. So, um, how do you um, get access to um, bus open data, the DFT um, system, um, to be able to create these predictions? So, um, bus open data service, um, just have a quick Google search for it. You'll find the, uh, the, the link to it um, right at the top normally. Um, and um, there's two broad areas um, in the um, bus open data service. One is information about publishing and um, actually links to, to publish open data. Um, the other bit, which is what we're interested in, is um, finding the open data and being able to use it. And so um, there are um, the, the key bit for us is, is find bus open data um, and um, there are um, two areas um, here which have been around for a while, browse data, so you can go on to there and interactively see um, which operators have published data um, and get links to those and download individual data sets, so that might be for a smallish operator, all of their operations, or it might, if it's a um, large data, uh, large operator, stagecoach, go ahead, somebody like that. Um, it's broken down into, into regions, um, some uh, operators down to, to garage level, something like that. Makes it more manageable for them to um, uh, produce it. It's also easier to consume if you're um, uh, looking to provide uh, information for a local town or something like that. Um, so you can browse it. Um, if you're going to consume it for a live service, you're going to put displays on street, you're going to provide an operator with a control room service, for example, you're going to want to be um, consuming that um, using a programming interface, an API, um, and uh, you can get an account and you can uh, and you can consume it that way. Um, recently um, added to it has been a, um, a download um, feature so you can go on and you can download um, timetable data and the location data and the fares data that's available um, in in zip files. Now, to go and download all of the timetable data for England, um, that's quite a big file, and so you can you can do it if you want, um, or you can um, download it in um, in regions. And these are the um, uh, travel line region geographies, um, which you've probably, if you've been consuming bus data for a while, will understand. Um, or you can just um, usefully download you know, what's changed since um, um, up to a week ago um, so that you just don't have to consume the whole lot. You can just um, add in what's changed. Um, for location data, um, you can only um, download it in one go. Um, but actually, that's not too big a file when it's zipped up. Um, when I tried it the other day, it was only about three meg, but it does expand quite significantly um, being XML. Um, if you're not quite sure what you want and how you want to do it, um, they've added a very useful guide me semi wizardy type um, arrangement that steps you through. Um, how you can um, access the data um, and, uh, and information on, on how to use it technically and things like that. So um, once you know how to access the data, um, how do I know 
um, whether an operator that I'm interested in has provided um, data. Again, newly added um, is um, the opportunity to have a look at an operator's profile. Um, in this case, Trent Barton. You can see what um, their operating licenses it covers um, and national operator codes. You can see that in this case, they've got the timetables, three data sets and 48 bus routes in that. Um, and um, there's no problems with compliance with their data. It meets all of the requirements in the Trans Exchange profile. Um, and so you should be able to consume that and not worry um, about um, any problems with it. Um, so um, if you're just wanting to find out and you know, has my local operator provided information um, and the state of it, that's a really useful um, thing that's been recently added. Um, so um, that's how you get the data. Um, what can you do with the data? Um, something that um, has often been um, asked, how useful is it? Um, and so um, I thought it would be really interesting this afternoon to ask R2P to um, show us what they're using data for. Um, there are people out there consuming um, BODS data to provide apps for customers, for countdown times and things like that. But the work that R2P have been doing um, actually starts to show some of the more complicated, some of the more potentially valuable uses that people might be able to put um, BODS data to. So we've got Steve Holloway from R2P who's going to um, give us a, uh, a quick whistle top tour of, uh, of something that they've been um, working on with, with BODS data. Welcome, Steve. I'll start my camera on uh, just to introduce myself and say hi, uh, but I'm probably going to turn it off just because uh, the internet in deep dark Wiltshire isn't brilliant. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it might uh, drop out if I leave it on. So, yeah, thank you for the invite along to this, Tim. Uh, and um, yeah, um, I'll try and stick to the 10 minutes and talk through the kind of the R2P solution uh, and what we're doing uh, for a couple of the operators already. Uh, right. OK, so uh, we're just going to pick up. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, so just picking up on what we've uh, learned so far, um, I want to show you what R2P are already did or how R2P are already using BODS, the ways in which we are using the data, and more, more importantly, how we're turning that data into usable information for both the operators and local authorities. Uh, just to say for today's demo, uh, we're using data from BODS uh, and we're looking at operators within the region of Brighton Hove area, so primarily Brighton Hove, but we've also got some stagecoach data uh, in here as well. Uh, so I think, Tim, you sort of reflected on this just a moment ago. Uh, so for the purpose of, of our solution, um, we uh, subscribe to both, for, for an individual operator, we subscribe to both the timetables data uh, and the location data uh, from within BODS. Uh, and a result of subscribing and digesting these feeds, uh, you know, we're able to turn that data uh, into, you know, into user information presented via our iConnect platform. Uh, so let's get rid of that and have a look at iConnects. And if we start on the right page, that's going to help. So this is the this is the dashboard of uh, iConnects. Um, and from here, the user gets an overview of the high level system stats. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, we're interested in the Siri feed widget here and the tracking status. Obviously, there's no signs on this system at the moment, nor support tickets, so that's why there's no information in there. Um, you can also see, just picking up on the um, national operator code um, that you were talking about, Tim, uh, within here, you can see these are the two um, operators that we're tracking, uh, and we're using the NOT code to um, identify those two operators. Um, so as we said, timetable information is important. And again, that's coming from BODS. Uh, if we uh, dive into our timetable module, uh, uh, we can look, uh, we can check and see how um, this solution is checking in with BODS 
uh, and doing the automatic downloads uh, of the timetable. So if we go into scheduled downloads, we can see here, uh, so uh, as an example, for the top one for the Brighton Hove trans exchange data, you can see we're subscribing to BODs. Um, you can also see that this, our system um, has uh, an automatic ability to check uh, those uh, trans exchange files. Uh, we set it for seven o'clock every morning. And what it does is it takes a, a review of the data. Uh, if there are any changes, it picks those changes up, down, downloads into the system. And again, you can see an easy check here with the last download date um, from the BOD solution. You'll also see that we um, take a scrape of the NAPTAN database. That's just there to give us the um, bus stop data that we're after as well. Uh, so that's really just a yeah, quick look at, at how we're handling the uh, timetable. Uh, so we just go back to our dashboard uh, and we look at the Siri feed health. So what we're just having a quick look at here is basically checking the solution, uh, checking the system, sorry, and just checking everything's working all right. Uh, and to begin with, uh, we get a nice uh, graphic at the top, which gives us just an idea of uh, the Siri feed uh, data loading. Uh, and you can see very quickly uh, just at the top. So 12 o'clock today, we're handling just short of 33,000 um, GPS locations uh, from the two oper operators that we're subscribing to. So lots of activity, uh, which obviously feeds into um, you know, real time predictions uh, and buses tracking around uh, and um, you know, reporting analytics that we'll go on to in a minute. Um, just on this page whilst we're there, uh, we can also take a look at our two Siri feeds. Uh, as I say, we've got Brighton Hove buses in here and we've got a uh, stagecoach. Uh, and again, this is just giving us the rag status of those two Siri feeds and telling us that they're green, everything's okay, uh, and our last delivery day is there. And if I take a look at the um, uh, subscription uh, for Brighton Hove as an example, again, just to pick up on, on the BODs, that's the URL of the BODs feed that we're subscribing to for these vehicles. Uh, and we can also set a start and end time for this subscription. So again, if you know that you want to stop using a certain feed at a certain date and time in the future, you can set that here and that will do it all automatically for you. Uh, okay, let's take a quick look back up at our dashboard and in our dashboard, this is where, from an operator point of view and also local authority, uh, our two main um, widgets in here are our map uh, and our board monitor. Um, probably fairly traditional for real-time systems. Uh, you get a nice big overview of the area. Uh, you get your vehicles tracking around with uh, you know, the scheduled adherence attached to each vehicle. So you know, early, late, on time, etc. Um, uh, but you know, you can obviously scroll in and we can have a look at that in terms of our board monitor, um, pretty much the same, just, uh, more, more information in terms of, you know, last fix, route number, trip number, uh, et cetera. And again, you get your, um, in the lateness column, you'll get some scheduled adherence there as well. Um, we can, what we can also do from here, um, is if we select, Let's go for something like the 700, which is the stagecoach. Um, if we go into the map, we can also see we're getting the center line data and we can see the uh, track drawn on the map. Uh, and let's see if we can make this work and select a vehicle. Uh, and then if we look at this vehicle, what we can see is, uh, okay, not a, not a great example. It looks like the beginning of this trip, this vehicle wasn't giving us information. Uh, but we soon picked it up uh, and what we're showing here is uh, the actual arrival time um, that's coming from the BODS feed, uh, the actual departure time uh, against the published time. So for, ex for this example, uh, the bus arrived at 12.50 uh, and almost left, well, left straight away, um, but it should have arrived at 12.48. So we're giving it a two minute 54 um, late status uh, and that tracks all the way through. And hopefully we should catch this vehicle up. Uh, and we can see around about now, uh, yeah, it's beginning to get later and later. Um, so that's that one. A lot of, 
not a brilliant example. We had some better examples earlier. So let's that was a stagecoach. Let's look at a Brighton and Hove vehicle. Uh, and let's see what this one's doing. So yeah, a little bit better. Everything's running on time, and you can see uh, yeah, see how it's tracking. So yeah, just a, a quick glance from the system, you can get a feel for how how things are performing. Uh, right, I'm doing right for time, Tim. I've got three minutes left, I reckon. Yeah, um, that's right. Excellent. Uh, just checking. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the final module that I want to talk you through, uh, and by far the more exciting, uh, is our analytics module. And if we just go into here, uh, of course, it wants me to sign in. Uh, what this does is this pulls through a whole heap of uh, you know KPI system metrics. Um, we can really fine tune this to sort of pull out the information uh, that is relevant to the uh, operators or local authority. Uh, but just by example, along the, foot, along the top line, you just get an overview. Everything's based over seven days. So over the last seven days, uh, coming from the data within BODS, we get total number of scheduled journeys, uh, number of scheduled departures, the percentage of tracked journeys, um, and then the on-time percentage, uh, really interesting metric, which makes a lot of people kind of sit up and kind of think, is that really the case? Um, we get, we're given average uh, minutes of lateness. Um, so again, this is saying over seven days against all the journeys that we're tracking, um, there's an average of two, right, uh, two minutes, 25 um, of lateness. Uh, and then we get the average journey time. And then digging a bit more into the sort of the final detail of against operator performance um, against specific routes or corridors. Um, we can look at um, routes with most uh, late departures. So, you know, what is causing this two minutes 25? Um, we can also look at the early departures, um, dwell points. Um, yeah, just, just a whole heap of, of yeah, like right, I said, I'm not going to reread everything on the screen, um, but it just gives a nice overview of, of how well everything's working. Um, and then what we can do from this dashboard is we can drill down. So if we take a look at, let's go for the 27. Uh, now what I can do is I can left click there and then I can load what we call a lateness dashboard for the route 27. This then brings the data um, up that's relevant to the route 27, still sticking to the last 27 days. Um, and what's, what's interesting is we can then filter between the outbound and inbound service, and you can really start to kind of drill into how your system performing, where are the issues on, on the system, and where can you make improvements. Um, and if we go to the inbound, just very quickly, I know we're running out of time. In fact, let me stop that. Um, if we go to the inbound, we can see that uh, you know, as an overall picture, for this service, over seven days, things seem to get later and later and later. Uh, we do, however, seem to get to somewhere close to, uh, where are we? The Church of the Good Shepherd, uh, and everything seems to start getting uh, back on time after that point. So uh, not sure what goes on at the Church of the Good Shepherd, but it certainly brings uh, this service back in time. Um, but yeah, you can yeah you can drill into that and lots more on top of that. So I don't know, Tim, I think that's 10 minutes done, is it? Uh, yeah, that's been uh, really useful, um, and um, it's good to see something other than just uh, an app or something like that using um, BODS data showing actually some of the uh, some of the things that operators can start to learn from um, if they've not had these sort of analytical tools um, before. So thank you, Steve. Um, yeah. That's been uh, very useful um, no and hopefully you, helpful to, uh, to to people on the call so that you can uh, understand more about what's uh, what's possible. Um, so um, to be able to um, do what um, Steve's been showing, um, you need to be able to um, match up some of the data. So absolutely key. Um, to being able to, to produce 
the analytics either for an operator or a countdown time for a customer. Um, you need to be able to link the data together. Um, there is a, uh, a guide to doing that, um, Siri VM and data matching document, um, which covers off um, how your data, that if you're a provider, needs to be provided um, to enable the matching to happen, which are the critical fields in, in your timetable and vehicle location data um, to, uh, to be able to, to pull this together. Um, and um, at the moment, um, BODS um, looks at um, the timetable data and provides um, quality reports and things like that. Um, they're in the process at the moment of developing um, quality tools for the uh, location data in Siri VM. Um, but of course, you can only do that quality checking um, effectively after the event um, because um, it's live. Um, and um, for those of you involved in providing data into BODS, um, there was a, a draft of the um, post-publishing check document and the, uh, and the quality document um, with all the matching stuff. Um, in it circulated quite a while ago. Um, the updated um, version of that um, is imminent. Um, just waiting for some um, final um, updates and tweaks from the um, development team once they've um, started to uh, to do some implementation, just to make sure that there's nothing um, final. So that should be out. Um, certainly before the end of um, this month, but uh, but hopefully sooner. Um, so um, over time, um, the data um, is going to get better and better. Um, so um, that's the end of the um, presentation. We've learned about um, how to get at BODS and how to create predictions. Um, and we've seen um, some interesting examples of how you can use BODS data for um, analytics and useful insights. Um, uh, if you're um, involved in an enhanced partnership, um, the stuff that Steve was showing um, is the sort of stuff that you're probably going to want to be uh, looking at from, uh, from a performance of the EP and the determining which routes need some attention where you might want to be putting bus priority and things like that. Um, so um, open for um, questions. We've had a couple um, in. So Mark has asked, how do we ensure the passenger receives consistent information, operator app, LTA, real time and third party apps? And give varying prediction answers to the same service. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a fair question and a and a and a challenge. Um, one of the um, reasons for um, bus open data coming into existence, if you go back to the uh, the conversations and discussions that were happening before the Bus Service Act. Um, was written um, was the um, patchy coverage of real time. Some areas, some operators had displays, some had apps, um, but it was um, a bit of a postcode lottery as to uh, as what you could get where. Um, BODs make sure that that is consistent um, across the country. Um, what it doesn't do is make sure that the um, the predictions are all calculated in the same way and things like that. But as um, more work is done on data quality, um, the the better that they will align and the more consistent that they will be. Um, We've um, uh, 
Uh, are they, Mike asks, are you aware of any critical differences in the data provided between the Siri VM and GTFS RT live location data? Um, so, um, bus operators need to provide um, Siri VM, which is their location data, and that is fundamentally just where is the bus at any point in time. Um, one of the outputs from bots um, is um, a, a, go, uh, a general transit feed uh, RT, which is a which is a processed feed, um, and so that actually is more akin to. Um, if you uh, are used to Siri, Siri SM, so a stop view of the world, um, and it's calculated um, data. Um, so that's the um, that's the big that's the key difference really. Um, one is just the pure location, and the other one um, is is processed. But the GTFS RT feed is using the data that uh, anybody else can use. Um, from BODS. So the data should be consistent. Um, and um, question about handling rural services where GPS and mobile phone coverage is poor. Um, yeah, that's a real problem. Um, hopefully, um, as um, mobile phone companies um, start to improve 4G and 5G coverage as they switch off um, 3G, um, that coverage will get better. And so there'll be less black spots and fewer problems. Um, but I think they're always going to exist um, and um, different suppliers prediction algorithms and processes are going to cope with that um, differently and some are going to be able to cope with it better than than others i suspect um, so um jeff you've got a question yeah you've just said about gps and mobile phone coverage one and the same thing now at the end of the day, us in a rural location, we have issues with GPS and real-time data. Now, it's impossible for us to get an accurate representation of what the vehicle is doing and where it is because of the lack of signal. Now, you're saying that over time, this probably get better. But how can, how can a system that's been basically in in the mix for some considerable time now rely on such an outdated method of communication i.e gps um well unless the department was going to put in place um a private um different communication network that provided well they're not going to do that are they no, they're not, um, because of the sheer cost of it. In the early days of real-time systems, um, before mobile phone data was um, at an affordable price, um, people would put up um, analog radio networks um, to, to overcome some of that, but even they tended to have problems in, in valleys and, and very urban, air, uh, very rural areas. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, it's one of the um, design choices um, and one of the challenges um, that um, an awful lot of um, systems um, going to um, have to deal with. Um, some mobile phone operators are more receptive to people pointing out coverage problems um, than others but if you're in a very hilly area you know if you're in um, deepest um, Derbyshire for example or Shropshire um, where you've got 
um, hills and uh, you know deep valleys and things like that, I suspect that it's always going to be a problem um, in some places. Um, and all that we can do is encourage better coverage from the mobile phone operators um, to overcome some of the worst of the problems. So, so realistically, this this whole bod thing is more for the cities as opposed to rural locations, because that's what it appears to be. Because there's no way that, the, that it's going to get any easier out here. We're not going to get a better phone signal. We're not going to get this. We're not going to get the other. So why are we being told that we have to provide the data? We can't provide the data properly because we haven't got the backup to do that. It's all biased and all started with London Transport. That's where it's come from. And it's it's more emphasised for cities, not, not out here. Um, I, it's trying to, to um, provide um, a service across the whole country. Um, well, the it city, doesn't work, though, does it? Well, th there, are, there are areas where communication is more challenging. Um, I think it would be interesting to um, have a bit more of a discussion with you, Jeff. Um, to understand quite where you are and some of the detail of your challenges, because there might be things no, that um, either BODS can do or, or um, we can help in, in our take um, to, to overcome some of the challenges. Um, but um, the idea is okay. to provide a service that covers do me a favor, all will passengers you? Go everywhere to, um... in the country. Can I just ask one more question? Yeah. Right. Recently, BODS, the, the system's been down. Now, we've been speaking to the BODS help desk, and the BODS help desk are telling us that some of the system is still down, and they're working with the DFT to try and resolve it. Now, we had a further email telling us that the um, we should be able to access the data, etc. Now, we've tried, and we still can't get on. Now... They're saying that they, they don't have a time frame for the, when the system is going to be back fully functional. So the question I've got is, the data that we would normally be pulling from bots for ourselves so we can be proactive and looking at what we're doing and not doing, will, is, that, is there a possibility that that data that's somewhere in the ether is going to be lost? Or will that data then drop back onto the system once the issues have been resolved? Um, I think that's one for um, the, the BODS help desk. Um, I don't think I can... Um, well, they're not um, very helpful, to be honest, because the, everything changes on a daily basis with BODS. They move the goalpost left, right and centre and then back again uh, quicker than the wind changes. Yeah, so um, I, I think, again, um, if you um, drop me an email, um, yeah. we, can, uh, we can have a chat and we can, uh, we can see what um, the answer to that might be. Um, okay. Because then we can, get, we can talk to, uh, to Mark and people uh, at the DFT. So, yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Has anybody else got any... Um, there's a question about um, historical data um, in BODS from Hitesh. Um, so um, BODS itself doesn't keep historical data um, beyond what an operator is providing in their trans exchange um, data set. Um, but Analyze Bus Open Data Service does um, consume the location data and the trans exchange um, and retain that historically for analytical purposes um, and that will keep it, as I understand it, from the ABODS sessions that um, we've held, will keep that um, from when the data is provide, first provided um, uh, onwards um, in time. So um, it's worth having a look, Hitesh. 
at some of the um, ABOD sessions that we've run um, because uh, there's a bit more information about that in those. Um, we are um, at two o'clock, so we need to draw this to a close. Um, our next session um, is all about sharing disruption information um, and how you can do that technically. Um, that's at the end of the month on the 30th of June. Um, please uh, sign up for that if you want to find out more about that. Um, if you want to um, find out more uh, about Artig um, and the work that we do or get in contact to um, ask a question or follow something up, then please do feel free to get in touch. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank Steve Holloway from R2P for his presentation um, on the interesting things that they're doing with BODS data. Um, and thank you for your time this afternoon and see you on a call soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank <music> you.